from Psalm 19, verse 14. May the words in my mouth and the meditations in my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So ends Psalm 19. Now in the larger passage, the psalmist has proclaimed the majesty of God as witnessed in his creation. The heavens declare, he said, the glory of God. And he has testified to the majesty of God's word. The law of the Lord is perfect, he says, reviving the soul. Then at the end, in this, the final stanza, he shifts the focus inward, for he realizes that in light of the Lord's greatness, his own glory falls feebly short. He is prone to hidden faults, that is, thoughts or actions that he is unaware of. But he is also tempted by high-handed or presumptuous sins, that are sins that are willingly, even arrogantly engaged with, even though he knows they're wrong. In both cases, the psalmist prays that God would reveal his faults and his failures, would restrain him, even cleanse him from the guilt and shame of them. And so it's at this point that the psalmist prays positively for what he has already stated in a negative vein. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now this verse is sort of stuck in my mind recently. On some level, the first part is easy. One may have enough training, may muster enough personal discipline, may be so fearful of punishment that they are able to publicly control their words and their actions. We tend to be good at putting on a show in certain circumstances, but God doesn't let us off that easily. Remember that Jesus said, for out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, our words or actions are a reflection of our inner being. And while we may be able to fool ourselves and others as to the purity of our true selves, God is never deceived. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse tells us that the word of God is living and active, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. As Samuel tells King Saul, man looks at the outward person, but God looks at the heart. As the psalmist points out, our hearts are broken. They are corrupted by sin. It's for this reason that that the work of God involves a change of heart. Ezekiel tells us that God will give us a new heart. Jesus tells Nicodemus that one must be born again. That's the language of a heart transplant. And it's good news, for when the meditations of our heart are pure, the goodness of our actions will follow. What I've realized lately is that it's easy to pretend. It's easy to convince myself, not of my own perfection, but of my general goodness. It's easy, relatively speaking, to put on a good show and to say and to do that which I know to be right when everything's going well, when I'm having fun. But in the last number of weeks, there have been times when it feels like I have lost that filter. See, in times of stress, in times when the valley's walls cast a dark shadow, suddenly the facade of inherent goodness begins to fade. And the meditations of my heart reveal who I truly am, what I truly believe, and what my theology ultimately is. I have never before wondered about the potential allure of things like anger, bitterness, resentment, and jealousy like I have recently. Never before have I been so confronted by my own idols. Never before have I felt so vulnerable so as to even wonder of the goodness of God. All that to say that what I've been realizing is the truth and importance of the psalmist's prayer and the context in which he offers it. We need God to change our hearts and our meditations. We must begin with an understanding of God and his glory. And while we see the character and goodness of God displayed not only in his creation, but also in his love for us and his concern for how we live our lives. This demands humility and honesty. It demands confession before him and the desire that he redeem and remake our hearts and minds. Herein there is hope. For God gives us the gives us and, and reclaims the meditations of our heart such that our words and our actions smoothly flow from our soul and so that we would see and enjoy him forever. So here's the challenge. Read Psalm 19. Allow it to become a prayer in your life that all of us might be more consistent in how we live.